that worship, you know the word hallelujah. It, it's two words connected, actually. It is halal, halal which a a h a l l e l, which means to, to rant and rave and praise God. And then wa, Yahweh, J-A-H, to rant and rave about God. And uh, thank you for helping us do that today, team. It was so beautiful. And you may know that we had a mother-daughter combo tonight, or today. Uh, it looks like nighttime in here, but today. But over here on the guitar was their precious daughter. And she also leads worship in youth ministry. And then, of course, Liz. And it was just great. It's great to see families. Uh, because it, it means that our vision is working. That we're passing it on to the next generation generational blessings. Well, I get to put a bookend on the kingdom series. That's not to say that we won't ever bring up the word kingdom again, because obviously the kingdom of God is what we're about. And I love that saying, Pastor Daniel, that the kingdom of heaven is here. And you are unconditionally invited the incredible thought that we've been invited into the king's courtroom and that we have been invited into his kingdom is quite amazing. But I'm going to talk more about the future kingdom because something about this kingdom, and remember that it was prophesied in the book of Isaiah that it would be an everlasting kingdom. We really have kind of a short reference to what the word everlasting means. We're eternal beings. We're going to live forever somewhere. But we had a beginning. God had no beginning. He's eternal in both directions. And so his rule, his kingdom, his reign is forever. And it covers our past, our present, and our future. If we have... A bigger debate about anything, it seems to be about the future. Because it seems to be so obscure, and even in church circles, we have debates about what it's going to be like. Seems as though we debate about two things the most. What happened before we got here, and what's going to happen when we leave here. Which it seems we know less about. <laughs> There's so much life in the middle. And that's where we are right now, certainly in the present. But it seems as though that justice requires a final showdown with good and evil. We kind of hear this in our everyday language. Well, they're going to pay for that. Well, they can't get by with that. God's going to judge that. We just have this sense of justice in us that says there has to be a closure. There has to be something that justifies and deals with the evil that is in the world. We anticipate things like Armageddon. Matter of fact, we've got movies about this, don't we? Because we think about and the apocalypse and things that have to deal with the end of the world, the final judgment. And what about Satan? Does he have a final judgment? Demise? Is he going to get by with all this trash? There's something in us that says, no, evil cannot get by forever. Now, theories abound with the end of time. And I would say, on the time of and the nature of the end. What's the end going to be like? Well, there's several attempts at outlining what that looks like. I've put five of them up here right now, but I'm going to need a little help. Let me start with this question. How many are going through tribulation? Okay, I need three of you tribulators to come up here and stand right here on the floor. You don't have to come up on stage, but just right here. I need one, two, three. Good deal. Thank you. Thank you. And turn around and face the congregation. And, okay, so now the reason I have these, these represent a period 
in the book of Revelation called the Great Tribulation. And we'll discuss it in a moment, but seven years or two, three and a half periods that could be simultaneous. We're not quite actually told by the scriptures. I assume because there are totally different things going on in those two, three and a half periods that it is a seven year. So we have the beginning of the tribulation. Then let's start over here, left, left to right for you. What is that? That's over here. So <laughs> the, the beginning of the tribulation, the middle of the tribulation, and the end of the tribulation. Now, I need one more person who actually will stand in for the millennium. If, are, you, are you any millennials here? That would be a great. Would you, would you stand? And just stand a little bit far removed there. Right there would be great. And you can't see it, but that's a thousand years between the end of the tribulation and the end of the thousand-year millennial reign of Christ. The reason I'm getting these timelines for you is to help you see some of these positions here because they are all trying to find out exactly what is the end going to be like and what are the timelines and how they work. So we have a pre-millennial, pre-tribulation position, which means Christ comes and gathers his church before the tribulation. And also before the millennial. So pre-millennial, pre-tribulation. Then, of course, we got some mid-tribbers. That is a position where they're still pre-millennial, comes before the millennial reign, but in the middle of the tribulation. And, by the way, I've taught the book of Revelation every other year for probably about 30 years. That doesn't mean I'm a master on the book of Revelation. It means I still got a lot to learn. And every time I read it, I realize, I realize how much I don't know about it. But all these positions can be found in the book of Revelation. As a matter of fact, I've tormented some of my Bible students who I've taught eschatology to, where I showed them all these positions in the book of Revelation. Because <laughs> there's some catchings away in the middle of the tribulation. Then, of course, post-millennial. And all of these are, are pre-millennial and post-tribulation. So at the end of the tribulation, still, but still before the thousand years. And then, of course, what is a post-millennial? That means that Christ comes at the end of this thousand years to earth. So all of it is about trying to figure out when Christ is going to come. Is he going to be pre, mid, post-tribulation, but still pre-millennial, or after the millennial. Then they have a fifth position, which is amillennial. And any time in the Greek you put an A in front of a word, you just kind of negate it. In other words, there really isn't a defined millennial. It's just a figurative interpretation, which is a little bit far-stretched for me, because unless the book of Revelation tells me a symbol, or it's a figure, then I take it literal. Like he told me that the dragon is a sign. So we're not going to be looking for a dragon. But then he gave us his name, the devil, Satan. And so he's giving us a picture of his nature and what he's like. So thank you, team. Can we thank pre, mid, post, and millennial? These end of time lines are not clear. Meaning, as I told you, you could show from Scripture just about all those positions that I listed, except for our millennial. And the end of time, okay, I just like to have a perfect line. And of course, the big debate is when is he coming? And there's a lot of prophecy teachers that like to tell you when. And matter of fact, I've read their books. Now, so far, they're all wrong. And really, all they had to do was listen to Jesus, because in his long message on the end time in, in Matthew 24 and Matthew 25, he was answering three questions by the disciples. He talked about the temple is going to fall, and not one stone is going to be left upon another. And they said, when will this be? So when's this going to happen? 
But they also ask him two more questions. What is the signs of your coming? Because he had already been telling them I'm coming back. And he hadn't even left yet. What are going to be the signs of your coming? And what is the end of the world? They had the same questions that we bring to the table today. But Jesus, in his speeches, as you go through Matthew 24, and you've heard this. I mean, how many times has, has an earthquake happened in California? They say, well, sign of the end. <laughs> or wars and rumors of wars. Well, it's the end. Listen. Listen to what Jesus said. The end is not yet. This is just the beginning of sorrows. This isn't the signs of the end. And so, then of course his disciples in Acts chapter 1, he's giving his last 40 day teaching with them. He spends 40 days with them after his resurrection and before his ascension. And he's teaching them about the kingdom of God. And it is there where he gives his commandment or great commission but the disciples had the same question. Jesus, when's, when's the end? He said, it's not for me to know or you to know. Only my Father, which is in heaven, knows. Now, the great author, Gene Edwards, had a great book where he talked about three kings. And he said, he said only God knows and he won't tell. <laughs> I, love that, I love that line because he does know. But he's not going to tell you. Matter of fact, if you figured it out, he would change it so that you wouldn't have bragging rights for eternity. But it's amazing how we try to come up with things that he told we're not going to know. Now, we might get a sense that it's the end. But do you know the first church thought it was the end? The Thessalonican church were having rapture parties. How do I know that? Because Paul writes us, if you don't work, you don't eat. They had quit working. And matter of fact, they were also very grieved over people who died because they were like, wait a minute, Jesus is coming back. How could they die? And they grieved over his loss. So here's what I want to give you is certain demarcations along the way. There are certain things that we know are going to happen. The first is Jesus is going to return. We don't know when, but he's going to return in the air and he's going to catch away the church. We use the word rapture. The word rapture is not in the Bible, but it means catching away. So it's not wrong to use the word rapture, an event where Jesus comes and catches the church away. I'm going to be reading some of these texts, but I've given you where they're found so you can check me out. Brothers and sisters, we want you to know what happens to those who die. We don't want you to mourn as other people do. Let me pause because I'm a pastor and I want to be sure that I'm not saying you can't grieve. You can't mourn. But you can't mourn as those who have no hope. Because we have a hopeful sense that death is not the end they mourn because they don't have any hope we believe that Jesus died and rose again when he returns many who believe in him will have died already so see that was the surprise of the Thessalonican church I don't I, we don't know how, how come they're dying he says, some are going to die before he comes back. And he goes on to say, we believe that God will bring them back with Jesus. When Jesus comes in the clouds to catch us away, he will have your loved ones with him. Our good friend Don Howard, Rodney Dean, Boris Roberts, Glenn Brown. He's going to bring them back with him. 
whatever loved one you've mourned over. If they're a believer, he's bringing them back with him. But now, in this saying, he's not coming back to earth. He's just coming to the clouds and calling us up to be where he is. Notice what he says. This is, agrees with what the Lord has said. When the Lord comes, many of us will still be alive. We tell you that we will certainly not go up before those who have died. The Lord himself will come down from heaven. We will hear a loud command. We will hear the voice of the leader of the angels. We will hear a blast from God's trumpet. Now notice this statement. Many who believe in Christ will have died already. Has he said that already? He has. But he goes on to add something to that sentence. He says, they will rise first. Now, wait a minute. They're coming with him, and they're going to be the first to be raised from the dead? How does that work? Very simply, death is the separation of the soul and the spirit from the body. And so, the soul and spirit ascends to God. There's some debate about that in theological circles. I don't know why theologians want to make life so hard. To, 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 to die uh, is to be absent from the body, is to be present with the Lord. That is an instantaneous act. They're not in a holding place somewhere. They're not in purgatory somewhere. They ascend directly to God. So what is he bringing with him? The spirit and soul of humans who have departed. But he's going to raise their body from the dead before he raises us to go with them. That's why those two sentences are so important. We believe God will bring them with Jesus. And they will be the first to rise from the dead when he comes. <laughs> Because he will reunite their spirit and soul with their body. They will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them. And we will be taken up in the clouds. We will meet the Lord in the air. I'm trying to be deliberate about every one of these words. And we will be with him forever. So encourage one another with these words of comfort. I've read these words at every Christian funeral I've ever done. Because you see, the grieving overcomes the hope. And we lose sight of the fact that we are not separated forever. We will be caught up in the air with them and we shall forever be with the Lord. This is, of course, what the angels told the disciples. Jesus finished his sermon in the book of Acts, chapter 1. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. And it says, and then Jesus ascended into heaven. He went right up in the clouds. And they're all looking this way. And two angels appear and say, hey, you know, the one that just went up, he's coming back in the clouds just like he left. Jesus is coming back in the clouds to gather his people, a catching away. Then here's a second thing we know. There are two, three and a half periods called the Great Tribulation. And I said already that whether that's seven sequential years or that's two, three and a half, I pers personally believe it's, it's seven because what happens in the first three and a half seems to be more the work of the Antichrist and the last three and a half is the wrath of God being poured out. Listen to what he says. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days. On the lunar calendar, that's three and a half years. 
They, they don't have 365 day years in, in the Bible. They have 30 day and they have 12 of them, the lunar calendar. Then he also said, then the woman fled into the wilderness where she was a place prepared by God that should be fed there 1,260 days. So those are two different periods that are listed here. And the context of the first is that God sends two witnesses to the earth to witness. It could be Moses and Elijah because the same miracles, and they're listed by their miracles that they did in the Old Testament, and it's the same miracles that Moses and Elijah did. And by the way, God has possession of both their bodies because Elijah was taken up. Did you, you remember that? By a whirlwind? He didn't die. He was taken up. Moses did die, but the Lord actually buried him. And then Jude says that Moses' body was argued over by Lucifer and God, and the angel of the Lord said, the Lord rebuke you. And when the Lord says rebuke you, who wins the argument? Uh, so God has Moses' body. Well, maybe he had use for it, and we see that in the book of Revelation. But the point being, those two periods, we know that there are two three-and-a-half-year periods, and they're probably separate ones, which means seven years of great tribulation. Now, I asked a moment ago, how many of you got tribulation? Well, you got tribulation, I got tribulation, all of God's children have tribulation. But this is great tribulation. Tribulation that the world has never seen before. Now, here is a third thing that we know. Jesus returns bodily to earth and rules for a thousand years. It's what we call the millennial reign of Christ. And we're going to read that in just a moment in the scriptures. But it also coincides with Satan's final judgment. We ask, is Satan going to be judged? Is he going to get by with all of this? No, he isn't. And there is already a predestined plan for his end or his demise. Satan's final judgment actually comes in stages or phases. Of course, part of it's already happened. Christ, death, burial, and resurrection. Look at the dragon, which he was very clear, is Satan and the devil. He's also called the accuser of the brethren. And in Revelation chapter 12, he says, The accuser of our brethren is cast down. Who has, <laughs> who has accused us before our God day and night? And we overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Stage one of Satan's defeat has already been brought at the, Christ, at the cross, and he has then handed that victory to us. That's why we're called more than conquerors. We didn't do the fighting, but we got the prize. More than conquerors through Christ who loved us. That's stage one. But stage two, a bottomless pit. Now, maybe some of you had dreams of falling before. They say if you hit the bottom, you die. We don't have anybody to attest to that fact. Uh, because if they died, we wouldn't know that they hit the bottom in their dream. But that sense of falling, which, by the way, is a very natural fear in the human. But Satan is cast into a bottomless pit. He has fallen and matter of fact, it was prophesied over him when he was going to put his stars above the stars of God and exalt himself, says, you are fallen, O Lucifer. There's a phrase over in Galatians chapter 5 that talks about you are fallen from grace. We can debate all day long about whether or not one can lose their salvation. And there's very little proof, actually, that we can because we are safe in his hands. But the fact is, 
we, we, you are fallen from grace really means that grace is up here. This is what God wants for you. And you're living way down here. He's giving you so much more in his grace. And here you are living on this plane. But let's listen to these words right here. And of course, phase three is eternal hellfire. Listen to these words in Revelation chapter 20. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan. So is there any question about who he's talking about? This old dragon, Satan, the devil. He bound him for a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and put a seal upon him so that he should deceive the nations no more till or until the thousand years were finished. But after these things, we must, he must be released for a little while. Now, that's one of the mysteries of the book of Revelation, isn't it? He's going to be bound for a thousand years, but he gets to sneak out again. Actually, he doesn't sneak out. God lets him out again. Now, who is he going to tempt when he comes out again? We don't really know. But would you imagine, though, in a thousand years that people would be born? And so we don't know exactly why he's let out for a season, but he does rally quite a crowd. After these things, he must be released for a little while. Then in verses 7 through 10, Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from the prison and will go out to deceive the nations. Remember, for a thousand years, he couldn't deceive nations. Now he's let out to go deceive the nations, which are in the four corners of the earth to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breath of all the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, which certainly would be a reference to Jerusalem. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Who is the them? The multitude of people that listen to Satan's deception. The multitudes. They were devoured. It says the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Eternal hell. That's been debated too, by the way. I read a book by a theologian because I had a friend who says, hey, I'm not sure that hell's forever. And there's this guy, his last name's Fudge. You need to read, read Fudge, and the book was about this thick. I promise you, I read every word. But he, he, in, in, the, in the introduction of this book, he actually quoted some very powerful uh, theologians that had solidified him as a person, not, their, not his theology, but that he was a good scholar. And so he quoted them. Then, of course, he also said, now, his weakness in his argument, he said, the only scriptures we have is in the book of Revelation that says it's eternal. And, of course, Jesus said it was eternal. <laughs> so, I mean, pretty two good sources there. If I could just erase a few verses, I could create a pretty snazzy theology to believe whatever I want to believe. But I can't run into verses that dispute what I believe and say, well, that's just what those verses say. 
No, I have to work them in, the whole body of work, because it's the Bible. And so I can't just dismiss ideas just because I don't agree with them. Hell is eternal, but listen here. It's very clear in Scripture. It was created for the devil and his angels. God didn't want humans to go there. But those who follow Satan and his deception do. And it is eternal place of torment. Our little finite mind doesn't grasp eternity. We, we, we work at it. I, I can remember running into the word infinite in math class. And it's like numbers are infinite. And I'm like, I don't understand. I'm still grappling with infinite. Infinite numbers. Infinite space. It's quite profound, isn't it? And so this is forever and ever. He's told us that very clearly. And Satan is, that's his final destination. There's also a final demise of the wicked. Now we saw here where he devoured them. But that would be their bodies. Is that all they get? Just burn the body up and we're done? If we were only body, we would be. But we're more than body. Revelation 19, verses 11 through 16. Listen to what it says. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like flames of fire, and his head had many crowns. He had a name written that no one except himself knew what it was. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called. So who is this king on a horse? He's called the Word of God. Now who is that? This is an exam here. Who is that? It's Jesus. How do I know that? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same that was in the beginning with God. And all things were made by Him. Without Him, it's not anything made that was made. And Him was life. And life was the light of men. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. The glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John 1, 1 through 5 and verse 14. The word of God is Jesus. So here King Jesus. And by the way, you see things like flames, his eyes flames of fire and his head had many crowns. Well, remember John's vision started with what Jesus looked like. And he starts listing throughout the book of Revelation parts of what Jesus is to us. Matter of fact, to the seven churches, he identified different parts of Jesus, but all of them were already listed in the vision that he had in chapter 1 of Revelation. By the way, this will help you with the book of Revelation because some people are just digging in there trying to figure out everything about the future. And John was very clear. I learned this in the book, How to Read a Book, <laughs> that you read the introduction to see what the author is going to talk about. Then he's going to be clear about what his theme is. A good writer is. John says when he sees this vision of Jesus, this is what Jesus said to him. The things that you see are things that have been, things that are, and things that are to come. The book of Revelation is past, present, and future. It's not just a future book. Also, the very first verse of Revelation 1, it says the revelation of Jesus that God gave to John. So what's the theme of the book? Jesus. You're looking for the Antichrist, and he just gets a little honorable mention in a couple of chapters in the middle of the book. And you think it's all about the Antichrist. No, it's about the Christ. It's really about Jesus. And my Bible college students over the years have been amazed as we read through the book of Revelation. I showed them Jesus in every chapter. 
because he's there. He's got different names and different expressions, but he's there because it's a hymn book. It's all about him. And I hope you read it that way because it will really help you. That's a good diversion, by the way. His name is called the Word of God. It says, and the armies in heaven clothed with fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. So guess what? Remember, we're caught up to be with him in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So we get a white horse too. <laughs> Are you horse lovers? And he says, now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule with a rod of iron. Remember Pastor Daniel's vision that Daniel had of these different layers and different materials that represented several generations of kings and kingdoms. But the rod of iron crushed. Here Jesus is seen as that one with a rod of iron and a sword in his mouth. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It means there's no king over him and there is no Lord over him. But who is he the king of? King of kings. Who are the kings that he's the king of? Well, see, you have to go all the way back to Revelation chapter 1, verse 6. He has made us unto our God kings and priests. We talk about the kingdom of God. And Jesus said, I'm giving you the keys of the kingdom. He wants us to rule with him. By the way, isn't that the beginning of the Bible? God made man in his own image and on his light. And he said, let them have rule over the earth. He wanted us to rule with him. But a fallen angel. By the way, not a fallen God. He's not a God. He pretended to be God. He wanted to be God. He tried to take God's place, but he lost. Satan himself wanted to be God, but he's not a God. He can't create. He can only manipulate and use your creative ability. He has no authority in this earth unless you give it to him. And so here, he's the king of kings. I think you need to start acting like kings and queens that you are in the kingdom of God because you have a lot more authority than you're exercising. Of course, things like in this final demise of the wicked is Armageddon. And of course, we love the idea of the married supper of the Lamb, and we got nice little pictures that have endless tables where we all sit and eat whatever we want, and there's no calories in heaven. But if you read the context in the book of Revelation chapter 19, the marriage supper of the Lamb is where he calls all of these things together and slays them. And the vultures eat it. That's the marriage supper. The destruction of the wicked. I heard John M. say this years ago when I first met him back in the 80s. He said these words. He says, the wicked do not believe in last days. They really don't. If they believe there will be a consequence to their intentional outward resistance to God, they wouldn't behave that way. What the book of Revelation tells us, there is an end. There is an end for the wicked. Now, you say, well, I thought God was a God of love. Let me tell you. A loving God 
would create a system that says evil cannot last forever. There will always be an end to bad and evil. You've heard me say it before. There's no problem you're going through right now that will last more than 80 or 90 years. Every evil in the world has an end. And that's what the book of Revelation is telling us. There's an end to all of this. And he who's bringing it is the king of kings. The Lord of lords. His name is the word of God. He's the king on a white horse. And of course eternal hell. Now we saw that Satan was cast into hell. Didn't we? Revelation 20. But then, picking up verse 11 through 14, he tells us that there is a great white throne judgment. Now, this is already after Satan's been pushed out of the way. He's already in the lake of fire. But he calls the good and the evil all together for a white throne judgment. Now, how does God determine who's good and who's evil? I, I, I was going to, but I didn't want to trouble my team so much. They're so good to help me up here anyway. But I wish I just had a big pile of books right here. I've got a few in my library. A pile of books right here. And it says the books of works were brought out. Now, this is kind of a scary thought, but all our works are written in a book. Good and bad. They're all written in books. And he brought the books of works out. But he says, but also, he brought out the book of life. And what is the book of life? He talked about it over in the earlier to one of the churches where he said that your, your name will not be blotted out of the book of life. That's a whole different perspective. We kind of like, think that when we got saved, God wrote our name in. But what if he has all of our names, but they get blotted out? The only reason your name would be blotted out of the book of life is because you reject the Savior of the world. And God gives you to the last breath to make that choice to the last breath now see he's such a merciful God some of you would have already zapped him you've already wrote him off your list by the way had to apologize to my friend Gary Galton he, he, he's a big Oregon Ducks fan and I sent him a text saying I was sorry for their impending loss but I sent the text a little bit early because they won. <laughs> and they really picked their game up at the end of the game and won the game. But now, see, I should have seen that already because Alabama does it all the time. That's why we like to watch them because we, we like to see how they're going to pull out of it. But the fact is, this, this white throne judgment you need to determine right now which books you want to be judged out of. Out of the books of works? Now, there's some people that are quite proud of their work. And so they think, well, I think it'll stand. But see, they might have missed a verse or two that says, there's none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's nothing in those books of works that will justify you. None. And when you stand before a holy God at the end of time, you want to be sure that favor's tilting your way. When your name is in the book of life, he looks, it, it, are they there? Yes. Then those works have been covered by the blood of Jesus. He's not going to judge you out of your works. He's going to judge whether or not your name is written in the book of life. But now, you can't at the end say, oh, I'm sorry, they got erased. Um, 
is there something I can do to inherit eternal life? <laughs> and the answer is no. Don't wait till the end, please. Don't wait till it's too late. Don't say, well, I meant to do that while I was still on earth. When you die, you do not get another chance after death. Now, the whole doctrine of purgatory says that you're in a holding place and God's still trying to decide where you're going to go. That is not true. Purgatory is not a real place. You may feel like you're in it right now, but <laughs> there is no place called purgatory. Matter of fact, the extra chapters we have in the Catholic Bibles called the Apophrica. They even call it the Apophrica, which means extra books. It's not to be canonized. It wasn't a part of the scriptures. But it's the only place that you can solidify the doctrine of purgatory, which the king and Martin Luther's king, or the pope in, in Martin Luther's day, raised millions of dollars with that whole theory because you can pay your loved ones out of purgatory. Now, my kids are broke. I don't think they're going to be able to get me out of purgatory. Thank God I'm not depending on that. And finally, the final rewards of the saints. And that comes in phases. The new birth. I return if eternal life. And this eternal life that I receive, and Pastor Daniel's been telling us that this is what the kingdom is. It's life. The Greek word is Zoe, the God kind of life. He's put inside of you. That's a benefit. There's also deliverance from evil, both on earth and in times to come. Phase three, there's a rule with Christ for a thousand years and I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them then I saw the souls of those who had beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had, had not received his mark on their foreheads and on the hands and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years they shall be priest of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. But that's not the only benefit. There's also phase four, the new heaven and the new earth. Revelation 21, verse one through six says it this way. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there were no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from heaven, from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he who dwell with them, they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and their God. God will wipe away every tear. From their eyes, there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. We're asking about the end. That's him. I will give the fountain of water of the life freely to him who is thirsty. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. And I will be his God and he shall be my son. But the cowardly unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. We gave this quote from George Ladd. 
early in the series. For Jesus, the kingdom of God was the dynamic rule of God, which had invaded history in his own person and mission to bring men in the present age the blessings of the messianic age and bring this messianic salvation to its consummation. Jesus brought the kingdom into from the past to the present to the future. And I close with these words from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which by the way is the resurrection chapter. It's all about resurrection, all 58 verses. There is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest. King James says, first fruit. In other words, he was the first to be raised. Then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. After that, the end will come. When he will turn the kingdom, that he is Christ, who will turn the kingdom to God the Father, having destroyed every ruler and authority and power, and all things are under his authority. The Son himself will put himself under God's authority, so that God who gave his Son authority over all things will be utterly supreme over everything, everywhere. Here's the consummation of the kingdom. All rule and all authority is brought into subjection to Christ and Christ surrenders it to the Father. He is then the supreme authority. Let me tell you why heaven is heavenly. Because the will of God is done by all there, uninterrupted. It was part of Jesus' prayer. Pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do you know that that promise is fulfilled right here in Revelation chapter 20? And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15? Because he brings it all together under Christ. And notice that revelation that we read, what it said. He's moving the heavenly Jerusalem to earth. When we see that phrase, a new heaven and a new earth, we think about renewing two places. But that's not what it's about at all. He makes two become one, heaven and earth. And listen how loving he is. He moves to us. Well, isn't that what he did in the incarnation? <laughs> the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. God says, hey, my dream was to be with you. I wanted us to walk together. I wanted us to be in fellowship with one another. I wanted us to rule together. We're going to have that dream. I'm going to bring heaven and earth together, and there will be no separation between us and God. Now, remember how we said that's all in phases? You can have that separation removed today. It's called the ministry of reconciliation. And you know I've been called to tell you about reconciliation. I have the message and the ministry of reconciliation. And here it is. That God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not holding their sins against them. That might be a new idea for you because you feel so in need of being punished because of the life you've lived. But he's saying, I'm going to put it all on my son Jesus and I'm going to not remember your sins anymore. I'm going to forgive you. You say, well, why don't he just do it? Because he put in a substitute and his son Jesus was a substitute and he said, you have to receive my substitute. You have to receive my sacrifice. I came and sacrificed myself. But if you reject the sacrifice, you are still in your sins. 
But you can have your slate wiped clean by putting your faith in Jesus Christ. Why don't we do that right now? Lord, we thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus who came to cast down the accuser of the brethren. Those voices of guilt and shame and condemnation that so separated us from you. But you says there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. We decide today that we're going to walk after who you created us to be. And we put our faith in Jesus, the sin substitute. We believe, Jesus, you died. That was our punishment. You were buried. That was removing the consciousness of our sins. You were raised again the third day so that you could give us new life. We receive that new life. And we now confess because your word says it about us. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away and all things have become new. Because you who knew no sin became sin for us. That we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. Receive his forgiveness right now. And call on Jesus to be your Lord. Just whisper the words, Jesus, you're my Lord. That really acknowledges that he's the king of the kingdom. If he's your Lord, he's Lord of lords. He's king of kings. We give you a rightful place as Lord of our lives. And thank you that we can trust you. For you to reign in our lives. We can trust you because you're a good king. We're thankful for that now, Lord, as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you all.